If you are into ancient Rome, and why wouldn't you be, you're probably familiar with the many emperors that Rome had. The good, the bad, the strangled. But did you know that Rome had a transgender emperor? Or did it? Hello noble ones, welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and on this platform we present plain truth. No political agendas, no nonsense. Some want to erase non-straight people from history, others try to push non-straight everywhere. I'm neither. I just want to know and share the truth, which is the fundamental access point to any higher conceptual level of historical understanding. If you type transgender emperor right now on the YouTube search engine, you will be showered by videos and flags that teach you about Elagabalus, Rome's transgender emperor, sorry, empress, who had preferred pronouns and identified as a woman, and they will present this as an unquestionable fact. To remain classy, I'll just say this. Unfortunately, most of these videos do not constitute a contribution into the historically based intercultural dialogue. These creators have zero understanding of classical period socio-political power dynamics and overlap modern ideologies. Therefore, from an educational standpoint, disregard. This topic necessitates reassessing, hence I propose a shift of focus to create a fair and balanced portrait of this historical figure, through correctly assessed evidence, textual analysis, reason and logic. Although I have to be fair, there is one channel among these that does it right. Mia Mulder, historian and transgender creator who has a video which is the most coherent, well-explained and intellectually honest video on this topic. Credit where credit is due. So today I'm responding to all of these videos, but only Mia's video should be considered as our interlocutor, if you will, as I'd like to structure a discussion on the social theoretical perspectives that imbue the forces at play as we read and review the period literary sources. As I approach both the areas of agreement and points of disagreement, I'd like to remind any new viewer here that on this channel we attack the argument, not people. I know that you noble ones will be polite and respectful towards any creator with different political ideas than yours. You're great, noble ones. Proud of you. Let's review the evidence together, underline both elements in favour of this thesis and elements that point to the contrary, and come to a fact-based conclusion. In order to provide an applicable assessment framework to support our construal of this description, I will now present a comprehensive analysis of the evidence surrounding Elagapolis and his demeanour. Within the correct historical context, as the overall meaning conveyed by language in context needs the necessary cultural filters. Context here refers to the social, cultural, political and historical background of the discourse, and it is important to take this into account to understand the underlying meanings expressed through ancient language. As a little bonus for those of you who love Latin, I will pronounce now the nickname of the emperor once within the correct reconstructed pronunciation in Latin. Elagabalus. Phonemic vowel length expressed. Now I'll just say Elagabalus for the rest of the video or I'll get a two minutes average watch time. Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, nicknamed Elagabalus, was Roman Emperor from 218 to 222. He came from a prominent family in Emesa, Syria. I'd like to begin my dialogue by saying that we fundamentally agree when it comes to the overall conclusion, but we have a different interpretation and evaluation of the sources. As Mia correctly states, there are three sources that describe Elagabalus to us. Cassius Dio, Herodian and Historia Augusta. However, since we'll be basing our entire assessment on these three sources only, a thorough analysis of the structural, material and characterological coherence and narrative fidelity within these descriptions will of course be paramount. Before the plurality of sources can be used as an anchor point in delineating this historical figure, we need to evaluate the validity of the information presented, particularly in a case like this one, which is not just historical, but it overlaps with the complexity of the human condition. These three sources do not have the same validity, weight and standing within academia. And besides, both Cassius Dio and Herodian speak extremely negatively about Elagabalus. What's also important to underline is that Herodian and Cassius Dio are substantially different, they are divergent, they often say different things. Cassius Dio does address a case of sexual ambiguity, Herodian does not. I'll explain in a second. Moreover, their words may well be a product or artifact of ideology, rather than a direct description of verifiable factual reality. 
In other words, there is no way to know if this is the result of empirical evidence acquired by observation by the authors or not. Whatever the case, what we do know is that the imagine that they are creating becomes semiotic in nature by intentional design. This representation or misrepresentation of the emperor is a symbol for the masses to see. Furthermore, the heavy usage of figures of speech and other compositional techniques within these texts suggests a much more multi-layered approach or rhetoric rather than mere descriptions of fact. Herodian is a contemporary of Elagabalus and he was possibly from the same Syriac cultural background. Cassius Dio, also contemporary to Elagabalus. Instead, Historia Augusta is a late document, it's from the 4th century, so it's not contemporary, and we don't know who wrote it. Was it one author? Was it multiple authors? I mean, the text in theory tells us that it's multiple authors, but was it? However it may be, the lack of an identifiable author does play a role in the assessment of the validity of a text and the information conveyed within it. When it comes to Cassius Dio, there is one thing that needs to be said immediately. He was a member of the senatorial class. I don't think I can stress enough how important or even critical to our investigation this detail is as we try to separate reality from propaganda and character assassination attempts. Keep in mind, the Senate hated his guts. So, anything they say about him should be considered as possible anti-imperial senatorial slander, in variable forms. Religious, cultural, behavioral, sexual. So we need to consider the very likely possibility that Cassius Dio's words are not only exaggerated, but they also represent an unequivocal appeal to a chosen demographic within a specific socio-political frame. Words carefully designed to paint this man in the most negative light possible from the perspective of Roman culture, effectively eliciting an emotional response from the audience that this was the manipulative intention of the texts is clear as day. Up to what extent the painting in negative light had priority over the correct representation of factual truth, we don't know. What we do know is that these are political opponents, Cassius Dio is a representative of the Senate who looks at imperial institution with caution. So, as we read the evidence from Cassius Dio, sure, there could be a one-to-one -one representation of Elagabalus, there could be an augmented, exaggerated representation, or there could be complete fabrication, with the intent of weakening our collective understanding of Elagabalus' real identity. Remember, ideology in concert with power provides legitimacy. Neither Cassius Dio, Historia Augusta or Herodian constitute chronicles. Historia Augusta taken largely from Cassius Dio himself in the description of the first half of Elagabalus' life. We can clearly see this in Historia Augusta because all of the emperors described are always painted in a negative light as dictators, underlining their cruelty and their lack of moderation, except for two, Septimus Severus and Probus. And it so happens that those are the two emperors with an obsequious respect for the Senate. Go figure. On the basis of all this, the testimony found in Historia Augusta is clearly biased and of doubtful validity. Let's intensify our focus for a moment. Normally, whether it be through imperial power or senatorial power, leaders in Rome constantly focused on maximizing provincial stability, marginalizing dissent or protests within the population, countering local destabilization, enforcing territorial unity, creating order out of division. During his reign, Elagabalus did none. Also, he was a young emperor of foreign origins, customs and religious beliefs. But did the Romans really hate him that much? Well, considering the fact that after only four years they offed him and his mother, beheaded them post-mortem, mutilated their corpses and threw them into the sewage, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say yes. So, grain of salt? Mountain of sodium. Be careful with your heart pressure. In their descriptions, Herodian calls him an empty-headed youth while Cassius Dio wants him dead. Dio refers to him as the false Antoninus, he nicks name him Sardanapalus, who was the semi-mythical figure to represent the last king of the Assyrian, a very hated figure described in Greek texts. He also refers to him as the Syriac. These all constitute old-school, old-fashioned Roman defamation. 
So it is highly likely that by reading these words we'll learn less about who Elagabalus actually was and more about the interplay and uneasy interactions between classical power dynamics and foreign culture. And on that note, if you're tired of politically driven lies and the truth is what you seek, welcome home. Become a noble one, subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. And if you like and wish to support this show, there is a good way to do it. I make these rings in bronze, gold, silver and many other materials. You'll find a link in the description below. They have this inscription in Latin which says Custos Veritatis, which means Guardian of Truth. Whenever I decide to talk about these topics, it's a risk, but I still take it and your support is what helps me to keep on going. Thank you so much for all those who placed their orders already. Within its text, in Herodian, there are zero mentions to anything that could be even loosely connected to a gender fluid behavior, gender dysphoria, and sexual ambiguity. Nothing. All of the mentions are on Cassius Dio, as we will see. So why do people speak about Herodian then when talking about the possible transgender emperor? Let me show you. But first of all, we are told that he is soft and effeminate. But within the classical period, in this very epoch that we are describing, that does not have a sexual connotation. It's how the Romans referred to several people that they considered to be inferior. And that's what they say when they want to insult their cultures and customs. In fact, in connection to sexuality, the only thing we are told in Herodian is that he had an uncontrolled passion for women. We are told that he marries and divorces several women in a row within Roman nobility, and then he also forces a priestess of Vesta, so a Vestal virgin, to have sexual intercourse with him against their will, and then he forces her to marry him, and this of course creates an enormous scandal in Rome. So he writes a letter of apology and justification to the Senate. Let's read it. He married one of the noblest of the Roman ladies, Cornelia Paula, and proclaimed her Augusta, but he soon divorced her, and after depriving her of the imperial honours, ordered her to return to private life. So that he might seem to be doing something manly, he made love to one of the Vestal Virgins of Rome, Julia Aquila Severa, priestesses who are bound by sacred vows to be chaste and remain virgin to the end of their lives, taking the maiden away from Vesta and the Holy Virgin's quarters. He made her his wife. He sent a letter to the Senate asking to be forgiven his impious and adolescent transgression, telling them that he was afflicted with a masculine failing and overwhelming passion for the maiden. So his letter of justification was, well, you know, I'm a young guy and she was hot. And keep in mind that Cassius Dio also mentions the situation with the Vestal Virgin, so we've got double source on this one. Now, if you did watch any of those videos, you might want to bring up the following passage. He had no desire to sin in secret, but appeared in public with eyes painted and cheeks rugged. These cosmetics marred a face naturally handsome. So he wore makeup, therefore transgender is the interpretation that we get on a lot of videos. Once again, respect to Mia for being the only person who underlines the fact that it's important to read these matters within cultural lenses. In fact, this text was not written in 2023, it was written almost 2000 years ago. In the eastern provinces of the empires, and even beyond, it was not strange for men to wear makeup, particularly when in connection with religious rites, and you have to remember that Elagabalus was the high priest of his god, the sun god. That is because a lot of these styles were in connection with the Phoenician style. So, did the Romans think that men wearing makeup was effeminate and weird? Yes, but within his own culture, it was absolutely normal. At the end of the day, let's remember that normality or what we consider normal is very much linked to one's culture. It was a commonly occurring practice, particularly within the context of ritualistic religious expression. So he wears makeup because he adheres to a tradition, not because he's gay or transgender. This is the indexical relationship between this description and the classical period. So, as we systematically investigate the context, we understand this behaviour to be dialectically related to social practices and structures in period. Extravagant foreign behaviour from a Roman perspective is all we can say as we judge this practice. The majority of the data that could actually be used to build a case on Elagabalus possible transgenderness comes from Cassius Dio. Let's read. The false Antoninus married Cornelia Paola in order, as he said, that he might sooner become a father, he who could not even be a man. For context, this is an insult. Afterwards, he divorced Paola on the ground that she had some blemish on her body, so he was a body shamer, 
and cohabited with Aquila Severa, thereby most flagrantly violating the law, for she was consecrated to Vesta, and yet he most impiously defiled her. Indeed, he had the boldness to say, I did it in order that godlike children might spring from me, the high priest, and from her, the high priestess. He did not keep even this woman long, but married a second, a third, a fourth, and still another. After that, he returned to Severa. So, so far, what we have is a hypersexual individual causing himself to be voted high priest also in his circumcising himself and abstaining from swine's flesh on the ground that his devotion would thereby be purer. He had planned indeed to cut off his genitals altogether, but that desire was prompted solely by his effeminacy. The circumcision, which he actually carried out, was a part of the priestly requirements of Elagabalus, and he accordingly mutilated many of his companions in like manner. Okay. So here is when we start to have something that may resemble what we want us to find in order to justify the claim that he was transgender. He wanted to cut his genitals off. Now, it's important, however, to underline that this is in connection with the ritualistic circumcision, which the Romans considered to be a barbaric practice. So, is this a truthful representation of an inner desire that the emperor had, or is it a way to make something foreign and barbaric in the eyes of the Romans to sound even worse? He practiced circumcision, well, you tell you what, he actually wanted to cut everything off. No way to know, so it's a little weak. Let's keep reading. He married many women and had intercourse with even more without any legal sanction. Yet, it was not that he had any need of them himself, but simply that he wanted to imitate their actions when he should lie with his lovers and wanted to get accomplices in his wantonness by associating with them indiscriminately. Okay, so this is the part where many believe that, yes, he wanted to be like a woman, he wanted to imitate women. But we don't know if this is a prehensive attempt at Dio to sort of justify the way that he calls him effeminate, and yet he was having sex with a lot of women. Kind of imagine it this way. Ah, oh, this guy is effeminate and weak. But he goes around and has a lot of sex. Well, yeah, but it's because he wants to be a woman. He wants to imitate them. Then we have an entire section where we are told that Lagabalus liked to prostitute himself at brothels. I'll just kind of skip through it as it's not really relevant. And then we have one of the stronger indications in favor of the idea that he might have been transgender. He was bestowed in marriage and was termed wife, mistress and queen. He worked with wool, sometimes wore a hair net and painted his eyes, daubing them with white lead and alkanet. Once indeed he shaved his chin and held a festival to mark the event, but after that he had the hair plucked out, so as to look more like a woman, and he often reclined while receiving the salutations of the senators. The husband of this woman was Hier Hierocles, a Carian slave, once the favorite of Gordius, from whom he had learned to drive a chariot. So, here we are told that once again he removed hair from his chin so that he would look more like a woman. This could be the Roman perspective, of course, but then we are told that he, he was married to a man. So he married women, but he also married a man. Now, of course, keep in mind that in ancient Rome, this marriage would have had no legal standing, but I'll make a dedicated video onto marriage in the classical period between same-sex attracted people. Then we are told by Cassius Dio that he not only liked, but also specifically looked for men who were generously endowed. Let's read. This Aurelius not only had a body that was beautiful all over, seeing that he was an athlete, but in particular he greatly surpassed all others in the size of his private parts, Aurelius being this individual that the emperor was interested in. This fact was reported to the emperor by those who were on the lookout for such things, and the man was suddenly whisked away from the games and brought to Rome, accompanied by an immense escort. Sardanapalus, remember that's a nickname for Elagabalus, given by Cassius Dio, on seeing him sprang up with rhythmic movements, and then, when Aurelius addressed him with the usual salutation, my lord emperor, hail, he bent his neck so as to assume a ravishing feminine pose, and turning his eyes upon him with a melting gaze, answered without any hesitation, call me not lord, for I am a lady. This is a very important statement. So how about we look at it in the original language in ancient Greek? Here's the passage with Macron's. Let's listen. Me melege gyrion, egogar gyriaimi. Me melege gyrion, egogar gyriaimi. Many thanks to Luca Ranieri at Polymethy Channel for providing the audio recording. Link in the description. Word for word, do not call me a lord that I, a lady, am. 
So don't call me a lord because I'm a lady. Dominus would be turned into domina if we have to imagine it them speaking Latin. So the translation is correct. He carried his lewdness to such a point that he asked the physicians to contrive a woman's vagina in his body by means of an incision, promising them large sums for doing so. So if these accounts are true, only the ones from Cassius Dio, but if they are true, then yes, he would be historically, within the ancient Roman period, the closest historical individual to a modern-day transgender person. Although, rather than being a person of homoerotic desires, as it would be in the modern sense, he would be most likely classified as a bisexual, or even better, a pansexual from the classical period sense, which is how it often is in these cases. Now to show you why this comparison and discussion is so difficult when overlapping with modern ideologies, let's make the discussion even more complicated and talk religion. So, according to Herodian, Elagabalus' crimes are based on the fact that he did not respect the Roman Codex of Culture. And this is particularly underlined in his approach to religion. Check this out. He plunged up into his mad activities, performing for his native god the fanatic rites in which he had been trained from childhood. He directed all Roman officials who performed public sacrifices to call upon the new god Heliogabalus before all the other gods whom they invoke in their rites. Even though the emperor seemed to be devoting all his attention to dancing and to his priestly duties, still he found time to execute many famous and wealthy men who were charged with ridiculing and censoring his way of life. In other words, you disagree with him, his culture, his customs, his dressing attitudes, his religion, you're dead. Not content with making a mockery of human marriage, he even sought a wife for the god whose priest he was. He brought into his own bedroom the statue of Pallas that would be a Pallas Athena, which the Romans worship hidden and unseen. But proclaiming that his god was not pleased by a goddess of war wearing full armour, he sent for the statue of Urania, whom the Carthaginians and Libyans especially venerate. Okay. <laughs> so he removed Jupiter of the main god, replaced him with his own god, married him to Athena, divorced him from Athena, and took a Carthaginian goddess and placed it in the centre of Rome. I'm surprised he lasted four years, to be honest, from Cassius Dio. Elagabalus also sacrificed human victims, and for this purpose he collected from the whole of Italy children of noble birth and beautiful appearance, whose fathers and mothers were alive, intending, I suppose, that the sorrow if suffered by two parents should be all the greater. He would examine the children's vitals and torture the victims after the manner of his own native rites. So, this guy was a full-on religious fundamentalist who would enforce his religion through force and violence, which was insane even from the point of view of the Romans from 2000 years ago, never mind today's standards. I mean, to the Romans, you can worship whoever you want as long as you pay your taxes. But this guy? At the end of this discourses, we have two possibilities. One, it's all a fabrication, none of this is true, and it was a way to make his foreign customs appear even more extravagant, and his personality. Or, this is all accurate, in which case it would be gender fluid. But it would also be a R-A-P-I-S-T, abusive of power, a body shamer, practice torture, a murderer of innocents and children, a religious fundamentalist, a corrupt individual who despised and ridiculed the poor and poverty. So. Once again, as a final response to all of those videos that say Elagabalus, transgender, one of us. If you are transgender and you're watching this, stay away from any association with the likes of this for your own sake.